nowhere near being a natural leader. In my first attempt at a role a good few years ago now, I didn't do well, and it soured me for many years of ever doing it again. I said to myself, never again. I was quite happy operating on my own after that as a technical specialist in the career space. Just recently, at Christmas time, one of my young friends told me that he'd deliberately avoided the leadership ranks, which is really unusual to hear someone say that. He reckons that the extra hours that he gains because he's not in a leadership role can be used for private wealth creation. And he thinks that it more than makes up for any salary he may have lost by not being a leader. But for most of us, I think the reality is that the more interesting jobs come with leadership obligations attached to them. And so with me, even though I really didn't want to, I eventually had to succumb myself to managing a team because that was the only way I was going to pick up larger projects. I did put in place a cunning plan, and I'll tell you more about that later, and now I feel more comfortable about my skill level. What about you? Perhaps, like me, you decided to improve your leadership skills or you're deciding to improve your leadership skills. Now, I love gap analyses, and you'll see lots of blogs where I talk about them back on the website. Now, gap analysis allows you to get the biggest bang for your buck. So by all means, do a gap analysis on your leadership ability and then put in an action plan, of course. But I think a starting point is if 10 out of 10 in leadership is wonderful, what does it actually look like? Welcome to Career Chinwags for the 21st century. I'm a career practitioner who's worked with thousands of clients over the past 20 years, so I've had a lot of time to think about the career space. Each fortnight, I pick up on an issue that I just feel like talking about, I guess. Sometimes it's really practical. So way back in episode four, I think I gave some interesting advice on how to prepare for a job interview if that job interview was going to be on Zoom. Other episodes, I tend to talk about more big picture topics. Podcast 15, for example, I I was encouraging anybody who ever has to recruit somebody to see the world from the candidate's point of view so that you don't end up missing out on excellent employees. In today's episode, I'm going to introduce you to Steve. Now, Steve is a real person, but of course his name isn't Steve, but we're going to call him Steve. He is your ultimate 10. And I'm not doing this to make you feel bad. I'm doing it to give you something concrete to think about when you're thinking about developing your leadership ability. Steve was a former colleague of mine in the leisure industry, and about a year ago I recommended him for an executive role. I actually raved about him, and as I was raving about him, I was conscious at the time of thinking, well, nobody's going to believe me. Yes, the CEO who I'm talking to probably trusts me, but Wow, how could anybody believe that anybody could be so good? Now, luckily for her, the CEO, she did believe me and she did hire him. Not that long ago, that particular CEO and I met for coffee and this time she was the one who was just glowing in her praise of Steve. Now, as a sideline and and as a bit of a detour, many of the attributes of my wonderful executive, Steve, have showed up in surveys of what employees are looking for when it comes to their leaders. So there was a lot of 2019 surveys which talked about these qualities. Clearly, it's not just me and it's not just my CEO friend who rates these qualities as important. So I think it's well worth you continuing to have a listen to Steve's 10 out of 10. So here are 10 qualities that I've highlighted in Steve. Number one, he never walked past behaviour that needed addressing. This takes a lot of energy and a lot of commitment. And what happens to most of us, I think, is we get caught up in whatever activity we're doing at the time when we notice the poor performance and we think, oh, I'll deal with that later. But the problem is we either forget to deal with it later or we then go through that self-talk and convince ourselves as to all of the reasons why it's appropriate not to deal with that particular issue. Steve always acted, but he was subtle about it, so he understood that managing poor performance was almost never black and white. 
So he was never afraid to pick up the phone and talk to me. So I led the HR team at the time and we would talk through together the best options. But I think the summary of this point number one is he would have plastered on his whiteboard in his office a famous quote, the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. He lived by that quote and he made it very clear to his team that he expected them to live by that quote as well. Number two, he wasn't distracted by unimportant activity or hype and he just cut through to the core of an issue. So after he left us, one of the organisations that Steve worked for was a not-for-profit where they had a team that spent a lot of energy applying for one-off government grants and the staff members would congratulate themselves about how much money they raised. But Steve quickly realised that one-off grants to establish a program that would only last for a year and would have no longevity and ongoing benefit to the organisation was actually a distraction. So he just refused to support these funding efforts. And instead, he focused on those grants that would allow them to have meaningful ongoing change. Basically, he wasn't sucked in. Number three, he was technically competent and he was innovative. I think Steve lived and died by data and he used it as a basis to make all his decisions. So he would look at the data and then he would use his critical thinking to make decisions. He would develop a hypothesis basically, test the hypothesis with analysis and then draw conclusions from what the data told him. And interestingly, just a month or so ago, Harvard Business School Online has identified data analytics as one of the three top skills that an executive is going to need for success this year in 2021. Now, when we worked together, leisure centres ran on the tiniest of margins. It was quite heartbreaking. If the data showed that change was needed, Steve would act immediately and he would use his knowledge of the industry to either introduce a new income stream or he would look at increasing a margin on our current services. Number four, he was unpretentious and ethical. Steve is a country lad, so perhaps that's why he treated everybody the same. There was never any doubt that he was the boss, but he didn't use his position to lord it over people, and he didn't use language to intimidate anyone. When we worked together, our leisure centre staff across the company were actually entitled to transfer from casual status to full-time status after 12 months of employment. And I can't remember a single casual who did that. And the reason that they didn't do it is they felt safe. They felt that Steve and his team of managers would treat them ethically and that they would get their regular shifts. So they just pocketed the 25% loading and, I guess, slept soundly at night knowing that they would be okay, they would get their shifts and they would not be subjected to arbitrary behaviour. Number five, he focused on cost control. Steve treated the company money as if it were his own. Now, in our low margin private business, that made sense, of course. But what I noticed is when Steve left our company and went to work for a large corporate, he continued to watch the pennies. I think he has an inherent disgust of waste. And so he would always ensure that suppliers offered best service and best price. Six, he respected his staff when he was performance managing them. I used to find it quite amazing the number of times a staff member would walk out of a performance review meeting with Steve and then tell me how much he or she really liked and respected Steve. And in the meetings, Steve would explain the issue in clear, unequivocal language. There was no escaping from the message that Steve gave to an employee. And he would never accept a detour from the argument or an unconvincing, lame excuse. He would bring the argument right back to the point at hand. And he would hold them accountable in a very polite but very firm way. 
this combination of respect and rigour just worked a treat and it was wonderful to see. Seven, he knew his own worth and had high levels of confidence. I think when you know that you have a strong moral compass, it gives you strength. And I think that when you know that you perform well, it brings you confidence. Steve was proud of his work and his efforts. And I think that meant that then he was not afraid to negotiate with other people for a a whole lot of things, whether it was a fellow executive to negotiate for scarce resources or even for his own salary. As I said, he had that inner confidence and knew his own worth. Number eight, he used the 80-20 Pareto rule to achieve effectiveness. Now, the example I'm going to use relates to recruitment, but he used this approach across all areas. What Steve learned early on was that poor recruitment, as we probably all know, almost always results in problems down the track. And together, he and I invested our time and our intellect in getting it right. And what I was impressed about is Steve never moaned about any extra effort that our hiring processes may have caused. He just got on with it and did it. The benefit for us, of course, was our bad turnover numbers reduced, as did the time we spent managing poor performance. Number nine, he looked after his body and didn't work ridiculous hours. I can always remember reading about a partner at the global consulting company McKinsey who was giving advice to an overworked young recruit there. The partner said, quite rightly, that the firm would have no qualms sucking her dry if she let them. And what he advised her to do was to establish a reputation of being an effective worker and then set limits. She should work smart, not long, and not apologise for it. Now, perhaps because Steve started in the leisure and fitness industry, he already had internalised the importance of health. He was hardworking, but he refused to be overworked and he made time to stay fit and strong. Number 10, he got his hands dirty when needed and went above and beyond the call of duty. Steve wouldn't ask anybody to do something that he wouldn't do himself. If we were shorthanded and there was a deadline, he would pitch in. And I can always remember both of us cleaning the dirty office that we inherited when we took over the Christmas Island Recreation Centre. This is really important in a culture like Australia because staff here are very quick to spot and then, of course, dislike elitism. So I've given you the 10. How do you rate? Because leadership is so hard. And I think it's more difficult to be a great leader if your early values were wrong, if you were brought up with poor values. Steve was one of the lucky ones. He was brought up with a great deal of love and care. He and his father still give back to the community via a little backyard operation where they repair bikes and they give them to kids in need. And it's really typical of Steve because it's quiet and it's practical help. What about me? Okay, talk about being brought up. Well, when I was a child, we weren't even allowed to say shut up. That's how much my parents cared about how we treated others. And my school continued this theme of putting others first. Yet I still struggled to control my own behaviour in that first leadership role. So what was my cunning plan that I mentioned earlier in the podcast? It's made up of three areas. I spent 10 years religiously reading Harvard Business Review every month. Back then it was the go-to resource for the business world. That exposed me to the latest thinking about leadership And it was always really practical. It was always based around case studies in a real and complex workplace. So I think that regular exposure to leadership best practice meant that I did lots of thinking about my own behaviour. As I read each of these articles, I would think about, hmm, Catherine, or maybe you don't do that, or, or Catherine, maybe you actually do that and you shouldn't. The second thing that happened at the time for for a good few years, I was also running a lot of training sessions about the soft skills, whether it was teamwork or conflict resolution. And so as I would prepare for the next day's training, I was constantly reminded of how to communicate well with others. 
And I think one of the best changes that came from this constant practice was that I minimised my tendency to blurt out the first thing that came into my head. So I became a lot better at self-regulation and self-control. And finally, I've spent the last 20 years working in an area where many of my clients are often very stressed and or very unhappy about their careers and their lives. And they're often also, they just lack confidence that things can be better. And that means I have to be so careful what I say in my sessions. And I think that care has carried across to other areas of my work. I will maintain to this day that I am not a natural leader, but I also maintain that I'm really proud of how I lead, given that it just does not come naturally to me. What can you do if you're a CEO or if you're an executive or if you're a manager? I think there's two things. The first is to look outwards to the people who are reporting through to you to look at their leadership capability. So rate your managers against Steve. Are they making their teams happy or are they making their teams miserable? Are they innovative? Are they cost conscious? Are they respectful, etc., etc.? Measuring them back against those 10 qualities. If they're doing well, let them know and, of course, be specific about it. If they're falling down, do something about it. And what about you on a personal level? if you've been assessing yourself against these 10 characteristics of Steve. If you're doing well, then like me, I think you should be proud, but you should always be watchful, lest those old habits creep back in. If you need to change, it's your job to change. Your staff are judging you, and the consequences of doing nothing will eventually catch up with you. You and I are paid to lead after all. Thanks for listening to this podcast. If you like what you've heard, I'd love it if you could share the podcast or leave a review. I'm doing a podcast every fortnight and next episode, I'm going to talk about the basics of preparing for a job interview. I've avoided this topic for a long while because it's such a big topic. So stay tuned. Remember, if you want to review what we've talked about, you can check out the full show notes on the website and the website is careerconsult.com.au and I do a mail out once a fortnight and it'll be a video or a blog or an infographic. If you're interested, you'll find a sign up form on the website. Let's finish with the hashtag. I do love my hashtag. Why not be happy at work?